Following the commencement of settlement in 1832, Highland quickly earned a reputation for its grain production. James D. Rowe, son of Highland pioneer Squire Rowe, claimed the township's fertile soils yielded as much as 40 bushels of wheat to the acre. When Dr. Samuel Pattison came to Fenton in 1836, food was both scarce and expensive. Alluding to the biblical story of Jacob, however, Pattison described Highland as, quote, our Egypt. There was corn there, close quote. By 1850, the agricultural schedules to the federal census show wheat being grown on 106 of Highland's 120 farms, producing a harvest of 19,890 bushels. Corn was a close second, with 101 farms producing almost 13,000 bushels. But turning such abundant harvests into flour or meal posed a problem, since there was yet no grist mill in the township. Instead, Highland's earliest settlers were forced to haul their grain to some other community to be ground. At first, this meant driving their oxen and wagons along the old Indian trails to towns as far away as Ann Arbor or Dexter, a trip that could take two or three days to complete. In 1846, however, Jonas G. Potter and Major F. Lockwood laid out a new village along the west bank of Pettibone Creek. Originally called the Village of Highland, it was centered on what today is the intersection of M59 and Harvey Lake Road. At first, the new town only had a few houses, plus a water-powered sawmill on what is now the northeast corner of Harvey Lake and East Livingston Roads. In 1856, however, Lockwood constructed a grist mill on the north side of town on what is now the northeast corner of M59 and Harvey Lake Road. The following year, in 1857, a post office was established and the village was renamed Spring Mills, since it now had both a sawmill and grist mill. To power his mill, Lockwood built a dam across Pettibone Creek, just north of the village, as shown on this 1909 U.S. Geological Survey map. In the process, he created Alderman Lake, named in honor of the landowner who sold Lockwood the rights to flood part of his property. It was also necessary to construct a canal, known as a head race, to bring water from the dam to the mill itself. This race ran along the side of the hill between Pettibone Creek and Harvey Lake Road, the thin blue line seen here. This photo shows the head race as it looked in the early 1900s. The tranquil water and willow-lined banks 
made it a favorite spot for picnics, swimming, and ice skating. The mill itself was a multi-storied wood frame building, perched on the side of the hill between Pettibone Creek and Harvey Lake Road. This photo shows the front of the mill looking east. Notice the ornamental woodwork, which decorated the mill's eaves and gables. The one-story addition on the south side was the miller's office, heated with a wood-burning stove. The lean-to woodshed was added later. The mill's office also briefly housed a small store and post office, run by Enos Leek, the postmaster at Spring Mills. Many today picture old mills as being powered by a large water wheel located outside the building. By the time Lockwood built his mill in 1856, however, that design was already obsolete. Instead, Lockwood's mill was powered by a commercially manufactured iron turbine, similar to those shown in these two 19th century illustrations. Water from the head race was brought inside the mill by means of a long wooden trough called a flume, seen here in this early photo of the mill's north end. Once inside, water from the flume flowed down to the turbine in the cellar. The resulting rush of falling water caused the turbine's blades to spin, turning the vertical shaft which drove the milling machinery. The mill's two stones were located on the main floor, inside a wooden enclosure. The bottom or bedstone was stationary while the top or runner stone was turned by the upper end of a shaft connected to the turbine. Grain was poured into a hopper at the top, passed through the open center of the runner, then was ground between the spinning runner and fixed bed. Grooves in both stones then carried the resulting flour to a discharge chute. Lockwood's mill proved an immediate success, as Highlands farmers lined up to have their grain ground locally. This in turn sparked development in the rest of the village, as new stores and shops opened to serve those heading to and from the mill. By 1870, Spring Mills not only had its mills and post office, but also stores, blacksmiths, a saloon, a woodworking shop, a wagon shop, and a large hall used for township meetings, dances, ice cream socials, and other community events. There were even impromptu horse races up and down Main Street, today's Harvey Lake Road, leading some to call Spring Mills the sportiest village in Oakland County. All that changed, however, with the coming of the railroad in 1871, followed by the platting of Highland Station in 1872. Within just a few years, the stores, shops, and post office all moved one half mile west to the new village. But while spring mills quickly faded away, the grist mill carried on as before. Not only was it dependent on the waters of Pettibone Creek for power, 
but Highlands farmers still needed a place to take their grain to be milled. Ownership of the mill changed hands several times. Lockwood held it just three years before selling to J.B. Baker. Later owners were Daniel Chatfield, John B. Krauss, W.C. Lockwood, Henry Elliott, and the firm of McFarlane and Sons. Finally, in 1907, the 50-year-old mill was bought by John Ma, who was destined to be its longest and last owner. Born in England, Ma came to Highland from Ontario with his wife, Ethel. This enlargement of a previous photo shows John leaning on a grain sack in the bed of one wagon, while Ethel holds the horse hitched to another. Ma owned and ran the mill for 37 years. By the time he died in 1944, however, the demand for locally ground grain had also passed, as prepackaged flour and cornmeal could now be found on the shelves of any general store or grocery. So after 88 years of service, the grismo was raised and the property sold to the state of Michigan for park use. Today no trace of it remains as improvements along both M59 and Harvey Lake Road have greatly changed the original topography. But while long since gone, the grist mill is not wholly forgotten. In 2009, a marker was placed at the Highland Township Library commemorating all of the mills which gave the village of Spring Mills its name. Among those attending the marker's dedication ceremony was Roger Ma, grandson of John Ma, who displayed his grandfather's wooden toll box. It was used to measure a portion of each bushel of grain being ground, which the miller set aside as his fee. More recently, a scaled replica of the old grist mill is slated to be the centerpiece of a new community play space planned for installation south of the township's library. Named Chill at the Mill, this new facility will allow both children and adults to enjoy a variety of outdoor activities, while at the same time promoting a greater awareness of and appreciation for the grist mill's place in Highland history. For more information about this exciting project, including how to become involved, visit www.chillatthemill.org.